Hi, well, I'm Miguel, I work here at Troid I'm, as a developer, and I'm going to play just uh, five lines about what's Troid and what we do here. Really, they are just five lines. So, mainly what's Troid is a set engine for classifieds, mainly, but focus only in real estate, cars, and jobs. But we also have in some countries uh, products and also um, um, vacations, um, rentals for vacations. And we are right now at 45 countries around the world. Right now we are opening Japan and some new countries in Asia, but we are always expanding and trying to dominate the world, so we have a lot of work to do right now. And about numbers and technologies, well, uh, we have a lot of millions of ads to process because, uh, well, my, our job is process ads, so we are focused on it. We also a lot of uh, sources of ads that are our clients also, um, a lot of visits per month, and we also have um, applications, mobile applications, and well, right now we are 100 uh, servitors, but we are growing every month. And well, this is a tech uh, meetup, so here we use a lot of open source technologies inside Trovit. We have a lot of different departments, web departments, and other backend departments, mobile departments, and others that are focused in some small parts, but we use a lot of different open source technologies. And that's why we like that kind of meetup, because we meet more people that love also the open source. <coughs> and well, finally, Right now, we have some open positions, so somebody's interested, ask after the presentation or send an a email later. So, thank you for, for coming. <laughs> yeah, that is really nice. And then, why they, why they changed the, the laptop? I want to. But remind you that this is a meetup also organized by Barcelona Free Software. We are a group of lovely people who are enthusiastic about free software and we love to have you over here. We like to have people who work on free software showing how they turn the beautiful ideas of free software into actually something that you can use and you can enjoy. And <coughs> well, today, uh, Olivier is going to tell us about uh, his job at Ubuntu, I think. So, yeah. Hi guys. Um, right, so I have no idea how long this presentation is going to last. Um, <laughs> we'll see. Um, so my name is Olivier. I'm a software engineer at Canonical. I've been working there since 2010. Um, and working more specifically on the Ubuntu for phones since its inception in 2012. Um, Right. Uh, so this is this is the first Ubuntu phone available on sale. Uh, it's been available since February. It's been sold by BQ, uh, which interestingly is based in Spain. Um, it runs Ubuntu, and it's available for sale uh, online uh, everywhere in Europe. I think. Unfortunately, not in the rest of the world. Um, and more phones are coming this year, so we're going to have more devices by different manufacturers, uh, which will be available in the rest of the world later this year. <coughs> so today, I'm going to talk about um, how Ubuntu for phones is different from other mobile OSs, how it's built, and how you and others can build for and on it. Uh, let's get started. So, um, how is this device different from the competition, basically? From Android, iOS, other mobile OSs? Um, so the first um, selling point is uh, the design itself. 
it's, it's been uh, thoughtfully designed since the very beginning, actually since even before we started working on actual phones. Um, the whole desktop environment for Ubuntu called Unity has been designed with convergence across devices in mind. So um, it's meant to adapt to all different kinds of form factors, like desktop, uh, phones, tablets, TVs, um, you name it. So um, this, been, this, this has been designed from, from the inception and it actually shows, uh, we've, we've been through a lot of different iterations on the design. It's actually quite mature in, in terms of, uh, of visual appearance. Um, and we have a very large team of designers working uh, from the London office, always, um, always updating and evolving this design. Um, the Ubuntu phone is content-centric, so um, we strive to not have anything in the way of the content. That's, um, that's what users want, usually. Um, they don't care about apps, they don't care about um, other kinds of widgets or, or whatnot. They, they want their content. Um, and what, what we see here on the screen is what we call scopes which is a, a great way to surface content on the home screen of the, of the phone. I'm going to talk about scopes a bit more um, in the next few slides. A very important difference um, in the user experience is the use of gestures. So, um, yeah, I forgot to mention, um, if you guys want to play with the device after the time, um, you're welcome to do so. so I, Unfortunately, I have only one here with me, um, but uh, you, can, you can actually touch it, play with it, and see how it feels. Um, so, we heavily use gestures. Um, as you can see here, we don't have any hardware buttons. Um, no home button, no back button. Um, so, what we use instead is gestures. It's actually pretty fun to see people uh, start using the phone when, when they're not aware of this particularity. Um, so I was at NWC earlier this year in February and we had a, a whole booth with uh, lots of uh, different devices for, for demos. And so people were kind of lost because they were looking for the home button. But once we explained them how it worked, they picked it up really fast and, and they actually found it much more intuitive than, than the whole back end home button, uh, the back button, you never know what it's going to do. Uh, it's different in every application. So um, we use gestures, swipe gestures. So if you swipe from the, from the top edge, uh, this is going to reveal the notifications. Um, notifications and a lot of different settings. This is actually pretty similar to what there is on Android, for example. Um, However, um, on Android you won't have um, that use of the swipe gestures from the left, right and bottom edge usually. So we use the left edge to display the launcher. Um, yeah, if I show that you're not going to see much. Um, and the launcher is uh, the same launcher that there is in Ubuntu on the desktop. Uh, so that's a quick way to access the currently running applications as well as the favorite applications. Uh, you can even access the launcher directly from the lock screen. So it's, it's really a, a quick and easy way to start applications. No, no need to go back to the home screen for that. Um, swiping from the right edge is going to switch between running applications. And if you do a long swipe um, all the way across the screen, you're going to get a sort of expose of a spread of um, all the currently running applications. So it's easy to uh, close them or to switch between them. And finally, the bottom edge is used for contextual actions. It's uh, basically application specific. It's reserved for applications. So any application can hook to the bottom edge gesture and, and do whatever cool stuff they want to do with it. 
Okay, um, I was talking about scopes earlier. Um, so scopes is a um, different way of envisioning the home screen. Traditionally on mobile OSs, what you get on the home screen is um, a grid with a list of applications, which is pretty boring. And um, it's also very quickly cluttered because you usually install lots of applications and you never know where to find them. Um, or widgets or the like. Um, here what we have is scopes. So it's um, basically kind of a lightweight application that's always running on the home screen and that presents content. Uh, we have lots of different scopes available um, and by default a few of them are already installed. So if you um, if you by this device, by default, the, the current scope, the, the first scope on the home screen is today. Gives you uh, contextual information about today, uh, dates, the weather, uh, next holidays, uh, events in your calendar, um, recent calls, recent messages, <coughs> this kind of stuff, um, the daily activity. But obviously, you can tweak it so you can uh, choose which scope is going to be the default one and you can easily write scopes for yourself so that your personal content is going to be displayed on the home screen. Right, so we have um, a nearby scope which uh, basically shows recommendations based on your geolocation. So what to do, where to go for eating, drinking, going out, uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, a music scope that displays the local content, the local music that you have on your device as well as uh, music from online sources, uh, news, um, well it's, it's uh, basically we have a, a very large list of scopes I think, uh, by default 50 of them and, and more that are available from the store. And finally, uh, a big difference with other players is um, the convergence vision. So this is starting to, to, be, um, to be big and actually other big players are, um, are starting to introduce this in their OSs. Um, see Microsoft do it recently, um, iOS is doing it as well. But we, we started with convergence like five years ago and it's been in the design since the very beginning. So, um, and, and one big advantage, of course, is that uh, we have an OS that currently runs on desktops, uh, laptops, phones, tablets, uh, even TVs, even though it's, um, the project is, is not actively developed right now. Um, servers in the cloud. So it's the same OS and it's, um, well, it, it makes, um, makes a convergence very easy. Right, um, and as a software engineer and as a geek, one, uh, I think one of the biggest advantages of uh, other players is the security model. Um, so traditionally on mobile OSs, what you do, um, uh, what applications do, or what the OSs do, um, when you install an application is that you get um, a list of permissions that are requested by the application. Um, so in, in theory, that looks great. In practice, it doesn't work at all because um, applications tend to request every single permission possible. Uh, you never know what they're gonna do with them, so they might ask you to read your contacts list, uh, to access to your location, to have access to your call history, and you never know why um, a timer or a, a game is going to be this kind of information. Most probably to resell it or something. Um, so that doesn't work in practice. It's, it's kind of broken. Uh, we have a very different security model, so we don't prompt for uh, permissions at install time. What we do instead is that we have applications running in containers. Um, so they, they are completely isolated, they can't, they can't harm the system, they can't interact with other applications other than with the ways provided by the system, with the system APIs. Um, and whenever they request access to a system service, like geolocation for example, um, 
the user is going to get a prompt, uh, but that's only when the actual call to the to the API is made. So if you're in an application and it suddenly feels the need to request uh, access to your location, it's going to prompt you, uh, and then you're free to accept or deny the success. If you deny it, then the application is not going to be able to access your location. So it might work in a in a reduced uh, mode, but it will still work. It won't prevent you from installing the actual application. Um, and of course, you can uh, you can uh, manage the permissions for all applications. Uh, you can revoke permissions and all that kind of stuff. Right, and finally, on, on the differences with other OSs, it's uh, very easy to customize. So that's mostly of interest for OEMs and, uh, and manufacturers wanting to sell Ubuntu phones. Um, but uh, BQ is a, is a good proof of that. Of that. We've, we've been working with BQ and it's, it's been very easy for them to customize the, the phone to their needs uh, because we built it with customization in mind uh, from the start. So I talked a lot about scopes, but it's not all about scopes. We have applications, of course. Um, we have, um, let's say, three different categories of applications. The system apps, which are the, the applications that are essential to the functioning of the system. So that includes the messaging application, <coughs> dialer, um, the browser, the camera, the gallery. Um, contacts application, uh, all that kind of stuff. This is uh, developed internally in Canonical. Uh, we have the core applications, which are entirely developed by our community. Um, so it's, um, it's actually very interesting the way we do that. So we have designers working on, on, the, on those applications, and, and they work together with uh, developers from the community. Uh, they get together um, on Hangouts and, and they, they design really cool applications. So that includes um, the music app, the calendar, the calculator, the file manager, the document viewer, uh, the terminal application, uh, which of course is essential on social phone. Uh, just kidding, we don't need it, but um, uh, for people like us it is. Um, the weather app, reminders, so um, that's a set of, of really high quality applications entirely developed by our community. Um, and of course we have lots of applications in the store developed by third party and developers. We have currently, uh, I checked today, we have over 1,300 different applications. Uh, and I will talk more about the store Alright, so now I'm going to explain a bit how the device itself, or the OS itself is built. So, um, running on this is the same uh, Ubuntu base that's running on desktops and servers in the cloud. That's exactly the same OS. Um, we basically took um, the the original Ubuntu distribution and we trimmed it down to remove everything that was not needed on the phone um, to have a solid base for that and, um, and then we added all the, the specific phone UI um, so this this is basically the same principle as um, Snappy I don't know if you've heard of Snappy it's been announced uh, recently um, so that's the latest uh, addition to the to, to the Ubuntu family. It's um, it's the, basically the, the, the version that powers things, uh, the Internet of Things, and that's exactly the same base as what we have on the phone. Um, so we have a read-only file system on the phone, uh, which prevents you from from tinkering with with the, the files on, on the root file system. Um, However, it's for developers, it's possible to make it uh, writable. And uh, we have an image-based uh, update system. So 
whenever there is a new update, uh, instead of uh, the traditional um, APT package management, um, you get image deltas that are pushed over the air and that apply uh, transactionally on the, on the running OS. Um, that means that um, it's very safe to, to upgrade. If there's anything wrong that happens during the upgrade, it's reverted to your previous state and, and you still have a working device. Um, and we're pushing updates. Um, so on the stable version on, on this device, approximately every, between every two to four weeks. Um, on the development version, every day there is new image. Like crazy during the week and, and 
have fun as well. And we also invite community developers to uh, come over and uh, take part in the discussions and the hacking sessions. Um, we have the Ubuntu Online Summit, so that's uh, the replacement for the Ubuntu Developer Summit, which used to happen every six months. Uh, it was getting really big. Um, it was a, a physical event. Everyone was getting together in the same place, but the last one was like 700 people. Um, it was not really scalable, so uh, it's now online, and we do it every three months. It's actually happening right now this week. So we have online sessions where we basically get together and discuss the, the future of Ubuntu, um, and it's all open, so everyone's invited to participate. All right. Um, so find my cursor again. We have a complete SDK to ease development for Ubuntu. We have a um, uh, development environment and developer tools which are based on Qt Creator. Um, we have uh, a UI toolkit um, which is based on Qt and QML, uh, as you probably guessed. Um, we have extensive do uh, uh, developer documentation, so um, if you go to developer.ubuntu.com, you'll find everything you need to get started including tutorials uh, and a localized documentation in uh, some cases. Uh, we have very strong design guidelines uh, that's important to ensure consistency across the, the OS. Um, otherwise, you end up with a very fragmented user experience where uh, one, one application behaves one way and the other application behaves completely differently and that's, that's very awkward for the user. Um, so we have a, a documentation written by our designers to um, basically give uh, advice, good practices on, on how to build an application. And we have automated testing tools. So uh, we use extensively unit tests as well as UI tests which simulate input events on devices and, and tests that the application behaves correctly. So the UI toolkit itself, it's based on Qt and QML. Um, so you, you have everything you need to write most applications in pure QML and JavaScript. Um, you can write them in C++ if you need it. And of course you're not constrained by the, the uh, SDK or the UI toolkit. If you choose to write an application in C, well, or, or Java or whatever Python, that's, uh, that's your choice. It's Ubuntu, so everything's available. Um, we have platform APIs to access the uh, system specific services uh, hardware. We have a comprehensive set of uh, native flammable widgets, uh, so QML components, along with the design guidelines that I was mentioning. And uh, we also have uh, those components available, or a subset of those components available to HTML5 applications. So basically a re-implementation of those components in HTML5, which means that you can have an application that looks and behaves exactly like a native one written in HTML5. Um, to find those applications and to publish them, we have a store. So that's uh, the Winter Store. You can publish an application in a matter of minutes. I just need a, a, an Ubuntu One account. Um, there is a, an automated and a review process. So most applications are available um, right away in the store. 
for applications requesting specific permissions or uh, doing funky stuff, we also have a manual. Um, and the store is not um, while uh, a central part of the system, it can be entirely replaced by a third party store. So uh, it's not a mandatory component of the system. Um, and we have a, a really cool web interface that uh, I can show you. I'll show you later on actually. Um, so that was developed by, uh, by a third party developer. It's a, it's a web interface to the store. And, uh, which you can use to browse and download applications to later install them on your device. Uh, more cool stuff for developers. Um, so we have APIs for writing scopes uh, to surface contents to the user. Um, so the, the easiest way to write a scope is actually a simple declarative text file. Uh, because scopes, the, the easiest kind of scope is uh, basically just taking a, an RSS feed and presenting it to the user. Um, so uh, you can write a scope in like three lines of, uh, of text. Um, but otherwise you can do really uh, advanced stuff uh, using the, the C++ and Go APIs available. Uh, we have a, a modern web app container. Um, so actually uh, a good number of applications available in the Ubuntu store are web applications. They're just um, HTML pages running in the web app container. And to the normal user, uh, they don't look any different. Um, I mean, users can't tell the difference between a native and a, and a web app. Um, we also have a QML web view component, um, which can be used for more advanced web integration into native applications. Um, and this is based on the latest uh, stable version of Blink. So uh, you always get, you get the, the, the most stable and, and secure uh, web browsing experience. <coughs> and uh, where HTML5 doesn't cut it, there is, uh, we have the Cordova APIs available. Um, so for access to the hardware and um, all different kinds of stuff from HTML applications. Okay, so before coming here today, I thought, um, okay, just, just a, a simple presentation um, is a bit boring. So I wanted to write an application um, that was cool and that um, was kind of contextual to, to here to the event. Um, and I didn't want to spend too much time on it, so it's just a proof of concept. Uh, I did it in half an hour today. Um, and I used to I used to live in Boston and I don't live here anymore, but um, I used to use the basing system um, to go around the city. And there is a, a really neat uh, API available um, made available by City Bikes, and um, I thought I would be using this API to display a map of Barcelona with all the available stations, um, you know, the, the, the very basic skeleton of, um, of a bike sharing application. Um, so, yeah, I'll actually show you how it looks. Um, and then I'm going to try and run it here because uh, on the device you can't see much. Uh, so this is the code. Um, as I said, I wrote it in half an hour today. It's uh, a little bit over 100 lines of code. So it's very simple. Um, but using the power of, of QML combined um, with the API, it's, it was very simple to display this. So I've got a map of Barcelona. Um, all stations, all basic stations are displayed with uh, a dot um, with a different color depending, depending on the availability of bikes and when you tap on the dot you get more information displayed on, on that station um, it's very basic, it's very cool, it's not uh, updated in real time um, it's, it's just the, the very basic skeleton so let me try and show you it runs
little bit more. Yeah, I'm gonna have to zoom. Damn it. <laughs> right. So this is made for touch. Um, and it works with a mouse with a wheel, but it doesn't here. Uh, and it sucks. Okay, that's the demo effect. You never know how it's gonna work. Uh, anyway, yeah. Uh, if I was able to zoom, I could show you how it looks a bit better. Um, but if you click on a station, you get uh, the name of the station uh, by explainable and slots. And supposedly you can zoom in and back and all this kind of stuff. So, um, and it runs here. Select and the font is white. It's a yeah, to yeah. Me. I'm gonna have to. The window over that here. Make the font bigger. So, as you can see, I'm running 16 lines of code. Um, and this is pure QML, um, no C, no nothing. Um, I basically um, instantiate a, a map element, um, which is powered by OpenStreetMap. Um, and then here there is an HTML, uh, XML HTTP request that does the request to the API. Um, that passes it and that populates um, a, a model that contains all the stations. And then there is here a map item view, which is a very convenient way of displaying um, a list model on a map. Uh, so basically I define what the, what the marker is going to look like and in that case it's just a, a circle, a rectangle with a radius and the color uh, depends on the availability of, of, the, of the bikes here. So that's very simple, very uh, trivial to do. Um, and actually, I might continue this application, make it a, a real application, and make it available in the store.